Okay, so here we go. It's three o'clock, so welcome. And thank you all for joining us today for this Bravo Leadership Conversation. We hope this year's Council of the Americas Symposium and Bravo series looks very different. We're proud to have hosted amazing leaders and pioneers in the virtual world. Today, I am very excited to welcome my friend, Dr. Julio Frank, President of the University of Miami for a Bravo Leadership Conversation. The former Health Minister of Mexico and former Dean of Harvard University's T.H. Chan School of Public Health will share his perspectives on a wide array of timely topics with focus on leadership and transformation in the times of crisis. We hosted President Frank at the beginning of this year, and after all the changes that the world has gone through during these past months, we can't think of a better time to revisit our conversation or someone who would be more knowledgeable about what is going on both in the world of health and in the world of education. Before we start, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Bank of America, the AES Corporation, MasterCard, SAP, SoftTech, Chubb, Latin America, HSBC Securities, INC and Microsoft, our partners at the Inter-American Development Bank and our media sponsors, America's Quarterly and CNN and Espanol and the Financial Times. Now, the first part of the conversation will be a conversation between Dr. Frank and myself. But then we will ask you, the audience, to ask questions. You will have the opportunity to ask questions as well uh, with Dr. Frank. So please use the Q&A box to send your questions. And without further ado, welcome Julio, and we are really looking forward to this conversation. What a timely moment it is today. So Julio, you have had vast experience in public health and you're now in your fifth year, wow, it's been that long, of tenure at the University of Miami. How has your experience in public health informed the university's response to COVID-19 pandemic? Well, first of all, thank you, Susan. I'm, I'm truly delighted to be with you uh, this, this afternoon. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we did speak uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, and it's, it's been interesting, a lot has happened. Um, so as I, as I was facing this decision that almost every university president has to, has to face during the summer, whether to open or not in, for in-person instruction, uh, in the fall, obviously, I, 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 I drew on my extensive experience in public health. It happens to be the case that although I'm in my role as university president, I, I, global public health happens to be my field of expertise. And this is actually the fifth uh, pandemic that I have been in, involved in some decision-making ability. I have to say, though, that, that the current pandemic is unlike anything else I have ever seen in my career, because both because of the extent and the depth of its impact. Um, so, uh, you know, like almost every university, we pivoted quickly to an online format back in the spring of 2020. The pandemic was something new. We, we didn't know we went fully online for the second half of the spring semester of 2020. But then the dilemma was what to do for the fall. And um, and that's where I did mobilize my expertise. And let me just, you know, give you the, the, the result. The result is we did decide to open for, uh, for in-person instruction. It was a very, very carefully uh, thought through decision. Uh, I agonized over it over many sleepless nights, uh, but, but, but it's, it, it, it was, I think, the right decision. And just to bring us to the present moment, this coming Friday, we will actually complete the on-campus portion of the semester. And so students will now be going home uh, before Thanksgiving. That was part of the plan. The part of the plan was to start the semester a week earlier and end before Thanksgiving. So students didn't have to go to Thanksgiving and then come back. Basically, we are now done after 14 weeks of having students on campus and uh, barring any unexpected thing in, the, in this last uh, three days, uh, you know, it's been a successful experience. We have been able to operate with um, the vast majority of our students on campus, uh, and, uh, and 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 we've been able to provide an instruction. 
but maybe it's a little bit informative for 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 the audience to to know what what drove that decision and what happened. That would be great. So, I mean, basically, I'm not going to go into all the details, but let me say that my decision eventually, it was very simple. I have a very good team, uh, was, was based on three major ideas. The first one was to avoid dichotomous thinking that has, I think, been one of the problems in this pandemic. There was the idea you either open or you go on fully remote. You, you are either, um, if, if you open, that's all risk. If you don't open for, for in-person instruction, that's no risk. And those dichotomies have been false. Uh, and I'll explain why. The second principle was to base everything we did on the best available evidence and try to stay away from ideological discussions that have surrounded the, the reaction to the pandemic. And the third has been to trust people and particularly to trust young people. So let me just quickly elaborate. The, the first idea was uh, that, first of all, it wasn't an all or nothing. It was pretty much portrayed like that. And we figured out we could actually um, develop a strategy, which I call an adaptive responsive strategy. And what does that mean? Well, the idea of adaptive reflects the, the notion that a lot of the drivers of the pandemic are beyond our control. Uh, particularly decisions related to, to government policy, uh, whether to reopen and what pace to reopen, those things are not under our control, but we need to adapt to them. And the second piece, responsive, means that we have a diverse community with different needs. So what that translated into is we actually, instead of us deciding, we actually gave the choice to students and we said, look, First of all, every student that has an underlying medical condition that's a risk factor should not come on campus. You should, we will offer you a great option, a fully remote option, which will be a great educational option. Number two, we have a lot of international students who had no choice because they either couldn't get visas or couldn't get on flights, but they also went onto the fully remote. But for the rest of the students, we gave them the choice. We said, you don't need to explain it. You don't feel safe coming back on campus, we will give you that option. Well, the result was what we already knew was going to happen because we were talking to our students. Three quarters of the students wanted to come back on campus. And so we we welcome back three quarters of our students, about 12,000 students total uh, uh, undergraduate, uh, the undergraduate level. But for those who came, what we said was, it's not gonna be the same thing as before the pandemic. And so we call our model a hybrid protected model. Hybrid because even those students were on campus, they would, you know, some classes would be online. Uh, for example, large lecture classes because of the need for physical distancing, we couldn't have everyone in a lecture hall. So some of the students would have to be online uh, and others in, in class on a rotational basis. And it was protected because every student, as well as faculty and staff, pledged to follow a number of evidence-based rules, which is what we all know. Mandatory use of face coverings, physical distancing, um, no gatherings with more than 10 people, uh, and a number of, of, of restrictions that everyone uh, signed on to, to, to comply with. And then we developed a number of platforms, technological platforms, first of all, a symptom checker, but most importantly, we developed a robust testing platform and a contact tracing platform uh, so that uh, everyone who, who, who tested, uh, we started testing mostly symptomatic students, but we gradually expanded so that now we also test everyone who's asymptomatic, and that allowed us to be able to be in, uh, tracing the, the evolution. And that the combination of those elements actually allowed us, we're, as I said, three days away from completing the semester to do so in a successful way. We knew there would be cases, but we, uh, but, but we, if we could trace, the, we, we could test, identify the positive cases, trace the contacts and have isolation and quarantine facilities, uh, 
which is another dimension of the hybrid because those students who are in quarantine or in isolation have no choice but to follow the classes remotely while they uh, while they are in, in, in isolation or quarantine. And the last thing I'll say is um, to help students comply, we use three methods. And, and I told all of this through multiple communications with students. The first one was what I call uh, um, persuasion through inspiration, try to explain what we were trying to do and inspire students. The second means was positive peer pressure. We uh, hired 75 students, we call them public health ambassadors, pay, pay them $10 an hour, so that they would go around with special training, uh, working with their peers to uh, uh, ask them and, and, and motivate them to, for example, continually wear their, their face coverings. And the third was, of course, zero tolerance for uh, behavior that put others at risk. And um, and I have to say that, that that leads to my third motivation. I, I just thought that the idea of not opening sent a horrible message. It said that we couldn't trust young people with a, rent, you know, with a sacrifice. It is a sacrifice to give up the social aspect of college. People in that age that have fought most wars, that have been the leading people in most, uh, the leading activists in most social movements. And the idea that we couldn't trust young people to actually make that sacrifice struck me as incredibly negative. And so we decided to trust students. And I have to say the vast majority of students lived up to that trust and the other thing that my public health training allowed me to do is it was, it was just not true that bringing students to campus was all risk and not allowing them on campus was zero risk. Most, a lot of students had moved near the university and they were actually safer on campus where they were supervised, where there were a number of structural rules than just letting them literally across the street, but no allow, not allowing them onto, onto campus. And the fact is after 14 weeks, we have had exactly zero cases of classroom transmission of, of COVID, zero, not a single case. So I think there's a lot of lessons here. Uh, the pandemic is not over. We're still heading into a very complicated period. And then there will be this semester still to deal. Well, what an inspirational story. I mean, you know, you should publish this because very few people, I think, have really thought about it the way that you've thought about it. Frankly, I felt very inspired and took notes thinking about, you know, as you think about opening um, offices, in some ways you have the same thought process, of course, not as many um, people as you have students. In, in the past months, you've stressed the fact, and this follows on from what you said, that the pandemic, rather than be an agent of change, is an accelerator of change. Can you talk about that? Because I, that's been our experience, but I'd be curious how you're seeing it. Yes, I think you know the, the pandemic has greatly accelerated a number of trends that were already in, in, in moving. Some of them positive, some not so positive. Um, the first trend, uh, for example, in education, was clearly we we were moving gradually to the adoption of uh, online technologies, but while wow, the acceleration has been incredible, I think you know back in the spring of 2020 when we did migrate to fully online because we didn't know what this virus was going to look like. In 10 days, you know we we had to migrate 1,700 courses which had been until then taught in person to an online pharma. We made more progress in those 10 days than in the previous 10 years. Wow. And, and it really has accelerated the transition to the adoption of technologies in, in, in the educational space. The same thing, you know, we have a comprehensive academic medical center. The move to telehealth, as again, we were already there, but it was really <laughs> progressing at a very slow pace. The pandemic forced a massive migration. Uh, telework is a third example of uh, of trends that were already there but have been accelerated. All of those, it would be a shame if we just went back to the pre-pandemic state. We really need to to see how we incorporate them in a better modality. The negative trend, though, that has been accelerated is the trend towards social inequality. Uh, you know, we were moving in that direction because that's just the, the, the way that. 
um, wealth creation has been happening, especially uh, with the development of these huge companies in the in the uh, IT uh, space. But the, but I'm afraid that um, a lot of the gains in the in combating poverty, uh, we're, we're going backwards in in many of those. And so that's probably one thing we need to, to the one acceleration of change that's that's very negative is the acceleration of uh, or the deepening of social inequality. So you, you've mentioned also that you look at the um, importance of looking at the pandemic as an opportunity to learn. And, and what do you think the lessons learned from the pandemic are in Latin America? Well, um, that's and what are the know, opportunities? Yeah, I I would say you know I would take uh, a number I, I would say uh, five big lessons, uh, and and they're very relevant for Latin America. Although I think they are applicable elsewhere as well. The first one is what I was saying: stay away from dichotomous thinking. I think one of the things that has been very harmful is this false dilemma between protecting public health or reactivating the economy. And I think that's been very harmful. That's driven some bad decisions in terms of the pace of reopening after the initial initial measures, the initial mitigation measures back in the spring. The idea that uh, that, that these were alternative or that there was a trade-off, I think has led to some uh, poor timing of the decisions of reopening and, and, and also confusing messages to people. You actually need to pursue both. And as it turns out, there's two measures that actually help both. One is to do extensive testing and contract tracing. That helps health and helps the economy. It's what we, you know, we're the second largest nonprofit employer in, in our county here. We are also an economic actor. We've been able to keep a lot of people with their jobs and create a lot of economic activity because we actually did all the contact tracing that allowed us to, 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 to be open. As you were saying before, there are lessons there for the economy. The second thing is the use of, of face coverings. And I think having politicized that is one of the lessons we, we can't do that. So that's one lesson about false dichotomies. The second big lesson is, um, and the opportunity I think, is the realization of those social inequalities that have been deepened. And again, this is not just Latin America, this is across the world. In the United States, we know that um, black communities, Latino communities have been most more hardly hit. And, and so the pandemic has brought to, to the forefront inequalities and the opportunity there is to start addressing them seriously, uh, even after the pandemic. The third lesson, and this I think is very pertinent for, for uh, Latin America, is the, um, uh, the importance uh, for Latin America and for the world is the lesson that we cannot continue to um, follow unsustainable models of economic growth. And what I mean here is that the pandemic is not a natural event. It is as anthropogenic as climate change. It comes, it derives from the way humans have been invading habitats have been uh, engaging in unsustainable and inhumane uh, practices for growing livestock, chicken, uh, pork. That's why we have swine flu, avian flu. This um, horrendous conditions in the so-called wet markets, all of those allow the these viruses to jump the species barrier. And so this is like with climate change, another manifestation of the way we are abusing our planet, putting our own survival at risk, not just risking other species, but ourselves. That I think is probably the biggest lesson. And then fourthly, I would say the importance of national leadership. And in my first engagement with the council, I mentioned, you know, the worst performers and, and this, there's huge variation Countries at the same level of development, same virus, same human <laughs> species, varying tremendously. And the one pattern that strikes me is the sort of overrepresentation of populist governments among the worst performance. I'm not saying it's a cause and effect, but I am saying that 
you know, you, you don't, not all the bad performers are led by populists, but you don't have a single country led by a populist leader who's done well in the pandemic. And here are the opportunities. I hope this will turn the tide backwards in, the, in terms of this sort of populist, nationalistic uh, leadership. Final lesson, I think, is global challenges require global solutions, and this is what we're seeing with the vaccine. This was the most amazing effort of international cooperation, and I think also the lesson, the opportunity here is to realize that, that global cooperation is a necessity and avoid the calls for isolation, xenophobia, anti-globalism that was um, particularly acute in Latin America, but also in other parts of the world. So Julio, I'm, I'm gonna go a little bit off script. I agree with your comment about populist leaders and you know policies that are not consistent with getting this under control, such as not wearing masks, such as not social distancing, such as going to huge rallies. Do you think that we can depoliticize some of these things at this point and 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 try to turn the boat around, not just in the United States, but in you know Mexico, in Brazil, in in many countries around the world? Yeah, it, it is all over. I mean, Russia, Turkey, uh, Hungary, uh, the UK. It's not a populist government, but certainly the prime minister has a lot of populist features in his style. And here in the Americas, I mean, you see the worst performance, the US, Mexico, Brazil, um, Nicaragua, all of them have this commonality. And it's because of what I would call the populist syndrome, which starts by minimizing, actually, not just minimizing, sometimes despising the opinion of experts. And, um, uh, you know, one of the main proponents of Brexit famously said, we're, we're done with experts. Right. Um, and and it, because part of the populist dichotomous thinking is to pit the people against the elite, and experts are thought to be part of the elite, experts and scientists. The second thing with populist leaders is the way they underinvest in science, uh, which involves critical thinking, and which is not what many of these leaders like. Um, so one of the good elements or aspects of this pandemic is it's brought a lot of experts in contact with with the common people you know you cannot turn on any channel without someone being interviewed yeah i think it's i'm hoping it will lead to a revaluation of the fact that experts are not this elitist who look down on ordinary people which is the sort of this discourse that that populist leaders try to exploit, but actually people who are there to 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 orient us all, people like Dr. Fauci, uh, or so many other experts that are become almost uh, uh, folk heroes, at least for a big part of the population. And and also it's brought home the value of science. I mean, what's going to get us out of this is going to be this vaccine, where we have all this great uh, news, uh, and 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 so. I, I hope that that's one of the positive effects is to to um, negate that dichotomous polarizing discourse and really show to the world how incompetent many of those populist regimes have turned out to be. I certainly hope so, um, both because it would be good to show that these populist regimes don't have the right ideas but also because we need to think about the health and safety of populations. Right. Um, we've heard a lot of talk about the new normal and um, you know, can we build a better normal? And so many, as, as we've talked about, vulnerable populations have been particularly affected by this. Um, how, can, how can we as a public sector and a private sector work together to try to uh, build more resilient societies? And what do you think the new normal would look like, in your opinion? You know, I, I actually think after every disaster, we owe it, we owe it. Those of us who, who survived the disaster owe it. In this case, both obviously the, the, the fatal victims, people who died, but also people who got sick and are we're going to live with some of the side effects for many years, people who've lost their jobs, their livelihoods. We owe it to all the people who've suffered so much during this pandemic to actually 
not just go back to what, the way things were. And to me, you know, having been in global public health for for many many years, uh, one of the frustrations for 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 those of us in that community has been to see how, with you know, the, 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 after each of these pandemics or public health emergencies of international concerns. There's a lot of attention while the emergency is going on. And then as soon as the acute phase is over, people stop paying attention until the next pandemic hits. And we've been seeing this, you know, there's been an acceleration in the number of pandemics. Pandemics are very old and they're accompanying humankind from the beginning, but they have accelerated in the latter part of the 20th century and the, and the 21st century because of those unsustainable practices that I was talking about. And every time, whether it's avian flu or the swine flu H1N1 of 2000 or Ebola or SARS, you have this growth in resources and attention. And then as soon as it's over, everyone forgets about it. We cannot do that again. We can't do that again. And I am hoping that the extent of economic losses with this pandemic is so unprecedented. It will be a wake up call. Because, you know, Susan, with a, an infinitesimal fraction of what's been lost to the economy, with an infinitesimal fraction of the stimulus packages that have had to be enacted to mitigate the economic consequences of the pandemic. Absolutely. On many times over, a much better permanent system of surveillance, preparedness, and response capabilities. It would really take a mini, minuscule fraction. And I hope now it's not just going to be us, the global health experts. It's going to be the, the economic decision makers, the politicians, the policy makers in the fields of economic uh, development and finances who are going to realize that it, that it, it, it really, we cannot have the same thing happen again. And some permanent solutions to future pandemics will be uh, finally put in place. That would be wonderful. So we now have two vaccines, which have reason, they seem to say there's reasonable efficacy. There are other under development and it's hard enough to envision how we're going to vaccinate in the population of the United States. But you start to think about how are we gonna vaccinate populations in Latin America, particularly when so many people live in the informal world, the parallel world. What, what's your vision? How are we going to do this? Because to be able to go back to, in quotes, something which looks a little normal where you can travel and do things, it depends on people being vaccinated, not just in your country, but I assume in others. Yes, you know, global problems, global challenges require global solutions and Science is, you know, the ultimate global public good. The fruits of science, in this case, these vaccines need to be available to everyone, both just on the basis of a human rights approach, but also out of enlightened self-interest in an interconnected world. We're only as protected as the people who are least protected. So, you know, we, we really, I, I hope this has brought home the idea of interdependence. Uh, we, we, we need, everyone needs to take care of everyone. Uh, so that no one is safe until everyone is safe. That's yeah. the basic uh, lesson, I think. Um, you know, I am very confident that this is going to to work. First of all, I have never seen the level of scientific cooperation on the on the front end of this. You know, the two vaccines that have been announced, Pfizer and the Moderna, they're not just effective. I mean, they they really exceeded all the expectations. This is a major major achievement of global cooperation, and you were talking about private sector, you know, the level of cooperation of scientists in academia, in government, and in private industry is unprecedented. And I hope this leads to a new era of that kind of cooperation. And that's how we, you know, think about it. It was just in January that we were, the scientists were sequencing the genome of this particular virus. To think that in less than a year, we have phase three, clinical trials showing two vaccines with more than 90% efficacy and very high levels of safety is unprecedented. Yes. Okay, that, that, that's the big thing that's been accelerated. So now there's all the challenges of production, uh, you know, industry with government backing, 
did take the risk of instead of sequential steps running parallel processes and there's already manufacturing of some of these vaccines the, the two that i mentioned even before they were proving to be safe and efficacious so that that will happen but then comes the hardest part which is to move from from efficacy in controlled trials to effectiveness in the real world and that has to do with being able to scale up production develop the logistics and distribution networks and then the very important thing we need science not just to develop technologies but also to understand human behavior and develop effective communication tools we need people to actually want the vaccine we need to make sure the vaccine doesn't get politicized like the face coverings and that's also going to require very careful communication um, so the challenges are still huge coming uh, uh, moving forward but but i you know just looking at the level of cooperation that this has triggered, I am pretty confident that we will be able to do it. Now, on to your question of what happens in countries with very poor populations. You know, actually vaccination was one of the areas where Latin America did very well uh, before, actually before the rise of some of these populist regimes, uh, which doubt experts and, and, and have neglected some of these elements. Uh, I, I uh, you know, it's going to be important not just to make sure that they that they are the countries are supported in buying or purchasing the vaccine but that the other elements particularly the logistics are in place uh, the pfizer vaccine is very demanding because it requires extreme uh, um, cold weather oh. cold, cold uh, conditions a uh, uh, cold chain um, but i understand that the company itself is uh, it's undertaking some of those elements so it's going to require that cooperation. And then we have an international initiative called COVIX, which is part of a larger thing, which is called the ACT, Accelerator. ACT stands for Access to COVID Tools. So it's vaccines. Uh, that's the COVIX uh, tests and, and, and medicines. And again, an incredible level of cooperation. I think we're seeing, again, the virtues of a strong multilateral system. And I hope on this year, which is the 75th anniversary of the UN, this is going to lead to a renewed emphasis and support for multilateralism. Because we cannot deal with these challenges uh, each country on its own. It's just not possible. I completely agree. And hopefully that will also uh, be a lesson to some of the populist leaders that have thought that we can do this on our own. So do you think we're going to be able to travel in 2021? I, I think I, so. I, you know, I mean, uh, it, it is going to depend on how broadly we distribute the vaccine. This is going to take the, uh, the best part, the better part of, of, of the next year. Certainly, you know, I'm hoping that by the summer, there will have been sufficient production and distribution that you can begin to, to, uh, to go back to more extensive traveling. We do know that transmission in airplanes is very, very, very low, mostly because people are wearing face covers and because of the filtration systems, um, uh, which by the way, was another thing we invested in <laughs> our classrooms here, very, very, very powerful filtration systems. It can be done. But with the vaccine, to the extent that this uh, is, is distributed widely and that the plans that are already being developed are actually carried out, I think we should see in the course of the first half of the year, and certainly throughout the, the, the remainder of the year, a gradual return to, um, to more, uh, more engagement and interaction, including international travel. That would be terrific. I think people would feel that the world has returned to something they understand better when they can actually travel. Um, so leading one of the top universities in the United States and having reach into Latin America, being Latin American yourself, could you share your perspectives on the importance of universities and academia as, as, as we try to build a more resilient and a stronger societies? Yeah, I don't know. The the pandemic has, again, brought to the forefront the crucial role universities play. I mean, uh, first of all, you know, our educational mission of uh, preparing the, uh, the, 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 
the, the, the future leaders, the most educated component of the workforce. But leaving that aside, which has been a traditional uh, uh, function, most of the research that has is now showing up both in the natural sciences as tests, drugs, and vaccines was carried out initially in universities or research centers linked to universities. So I think people have now understood. We here at the University of Miami, we've been part of the clinical trials for two of the vaccines. Wow. Uh, the Moderna and the, and the Jensen vaccine, which is still ongoing. Um, but, 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 but the fundamental research, the, the new technologies in vaccine production, most of that stems from research carried out at universities. And a lot of universities, including mine, have uh, academic health systems, which deal with a more complicated case. So we have been on the forefront of actually providing healthcare to the sickest patient. But there's something more important, I think. Uh, we, I, I always think of universities as exemplary institutions, by which I mean, this is, by the way, a very old idea, that the idea that universities through the values they embrace and the behaviors they exhibit, they set an example to the larger society of which they are a part. And I think we can, we should be an example, be exemplary in the way we embrace international co cooperation, which we tend to do, because that's the nature of universities. For example, we have, we're part here of something called the Hemispheric University Consortium which is 14 universities from the entire hemisphere working together, many of these issues. The second thing is we embrace, at a time when people are so polarized, the value of, of using uh, reason and, and the value of respectful disagreement. The idea is not to achieve unanimity, but to be able to disagree in a respectful way. The value of civil discourse and the use of reason in trying to deal with our, our, our different uh, difference of opinion. And we also illustrate the values of diversity and inclusion at a time when, when we are so, uh, when we're seeing the, the deepening of social inequalities. Lastly, universities, higher education has played and needs to be very focused on again playing its role as the most legitimate avenue for upward social mobility. At a time of growing inequality, this is going to be absolutely crucial. So I, I think in the region, in Latin America in general, uh, and around the world, those roles of universities are uh, have become even more salient uh, during this pandemic. Thank you. So we're going to start to take some uh, questions from the floor. And the first one is a great question. What does science tell us about the origin of the virus and how do we explain the secrecy in China and the reaction of the WHO? You know, um, I mean, we, we know a lot about the, the, the virus. This is not new. This virus, like almost all uh, the previous pandemics, is a zoonosis, meaning uh, diseases that are present in, in other animal species other than humans, and then jump the barrier. Um, this is a coronavirus very similar to SARS and to MERS, uh, 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 the, the Mideast uh, Respiratory Syndrome, the se Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, just to spell out the, the acronyms. Um, and then a whole variety of coronaviruses that cause all kinds of respiratory diseases, including the common cold. This is not a mystery virus. Um, I, I really do not believe that there was uh, uh, anything but the same process that happened with SARS. Now, what I do find unforgivable, and it speaks to what I was talking about before, how we just forget the lessons once the acute phase is over. With SARS, we had the same situation. Those wet markets where humans coexist in conditions of promiscuity with live animals, you know, conditions of inhumane conditions for the animals and very unsanitary conditions for all the animals, including the human animals who are coexisting with the other animal. That is what creates the conditions for those viruses to jump the species barrier. And because they are new, that's why we call them novel viruses. Everyone, all the almost 8 billion people on the planet 
are susceptible because we have never encountered. And you add to that the interdependence and you rapidly get a pandemic. So I, I think, um, you know, we, we need to do a thorough investigation. I, I don't think the WHO was hiding anything. One of the lessons here is we need to give WHO much more power to intervene. Right now, if there's an outbreak, there's a strong incentive for countries to withhold the information because it has huge economic implications. We gotta create a system that neutralizes that negative incentive, that provides a sort of insurance mechanism. This has been proposed in the past, an insurance mechanism may be based at the World Bank that would indemnify uh, countries that come forth and declare as is their duty. But we also need to have, you know, WHO needs to have a standing invitation so they don't need permission every time there's an emergency. And we can send people wherever there's an outbreak to investigate. But I, I would stay away from conspiracy theories. We have a lot of bad practices to deal with without imagining others. We need to uh, introduce sustainable practices for growing food that doesn't put other species at risk, that doesn't eliminate diversity or put a diver biodiversity at risk, and that doesn't put ourselves at risk. Thank you. Um, the next question is in line with universal health coverage, which obviously is a huge topic in this country, um, the ambition, how do you see um, patients with rare diseases, how will they get, how do, how do patients with rare diseases get the help that they need if, when you go to a, maybe a universal health care system? Well, that's a great question. I mean, it, I mean, one of the effects of the pandemic, by the way, has been that so many resources have been used to deal with COVID patients, and rightly so. You know, in the United States, deaths by COVID are already the second cause of death. And in Mexico, at the rhythm we're going with a very, very poor response, it's going to be the leading cause of death by the end of the year. So, wow. but what happens What's happened, one of the incredible bad effects of, of the pandemic is all the people who are sick with all the other stuff, not rare diseases, common diseases like cancer, like uh, heart disease, like diabetes, whose care has been postponed or even compromised. We're seeing this even with preventive measures. We're all focused on COVID, but there's a drop in immunizations for which for routine immunizations we have the, the resurgence of cases of measles around the world and other vaccine preventable diseases because you know we, everyone is focused on, on COVID and because the health systems are weak. So the not just for rare diseases, there are other diseases that are being the attention of which has been compromised by the pandemic. But in general, your point under you know non-pandemic conditions. Uh, you know, we, we need to make sure that we have a transparent process so that even rare diseases get their attention. And, you know, we don't have time today, but uh, I would urge you to read a lot. The When I was Minister of Health of Mexico, because I was appointed as a technocrat, I say without any shame, uh, it was um, the fruit of our, an idea that now seems weird, which was to have an expert in the cabinet. Uh, not uh, I, I, not a, a partisan member of a cabinet. Uh, we actually took great care in the scheme that we introduced to have a transparent process with transparent and explicit criteria built into the law about the, how we would set priorities so that based on evidence, as the volume of funding grew, we were able to cover more and more diseases. But it was public deliberation use of evidence that guided those decisions. And I think that's the way um, that uh, those priorities should be set. So the third question from the audience is, um, how has the pandemic intensified the transition between Seguro Popular and Savi in Mexico? And how has this transition demonstrated the shortcomings of removing the private sector and reforming the health system? Well, the, the, the story in Mexico is, 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 is sad. There was, um, you know, the, 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 yes. the first two years of the administration, uh, an administration that was ideologically inclined, very much in line with populist, the populist syndrome, to basically say that everything that came before was wrong. 
and, and the administration had embarked on a destruction, a process of institutional destruction. And that the health sector was not immune to that. And so the new government had cut the budget, grew the budget for the sort of the equivalent of the CDC. Now, no one knew a pandemic was coming, but that was sure. not a very good coincidence. And then they destroyed a financial mechanism that was called Seguro Popular, thanks to which the budget for health had grown fourfold in the previous 15 years after controlling for inflation. They destroyed that. So when 2020 appears, there's a new entity without any clear rules, with a lot of confusion. And then in a horrible coincidence, I mean, this, this was just a bad, bad timing, the pandemic hits. The pandemic got or found the health system in a very, very weak situation. And I think the pandemic has brought to light, you know, previous weaknesses of the health system. The health system needed a lot of improvement. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the way societies progress is when you build, and you, you identify what's wrong and you attack that. You don't just, you know, declare that everything was wrong and you destroy what's good and what's wrong. And unfortunately, Mexico had embarked in this latter avenue, and a lot of good things that were there were also destroyed and weakened. So the pandemic has has caught the, the health system in a very weak place, including weakening the role of the private sector. The government, again, based on ideology, has tried to displace uh, the private sector involvement in distribution of drugs. It's going to be very important to have those that expertise of distribution with the vaccine. So, you know, I think they're falling victim to some of that ideologically driven uh, um, policies. And I hope the pandemic is a wake up call to try to, to bring ourselves back to a reformist, Absolutely. Agenda, which I applaud, but not one that's based on destruction, but ones that based on identifying what's wrong, corruption, inefficiency, rooting that out, but then building on, on, on things that, that are actually strong and not destroying also the, the strong aspects of the system. I think there would be a lot of support for that path. Um, so how can we incentivate countries to declare outbreaks and be more transparent as we move forward? You touched on this, but this is, I guess, one of the most important questions, right? Well, I think, you know, to be honest, Part of what, what needs to happen now is really a, 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 a strong reform of the international governance architecture to protect us from these threats. I think, you know, we have a, actually a pretty good instrument. It's called international health regulations. It, it has the power of a treaty and every country has subscribed to that, but it has no enforcement powers. And I think we need to have a combination of incentives. I was talking about providing an insurance mechanism that incentivizes epidemiologic transparency. We had an example, and you know, if you remember the H1N1, the, the, the previous pandemic, which was 2009 H1N1 swine flu, the first countries were Mexico and the United States. And Mexico, contrary to what China did this time, immediately declared the pandemic and paid a huge economic price. Now, Mexico is, you know, a, 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 an upper middle income country and could withstand that. Uh, there's a lot of incentives not to do, not to behave in the responsible way that Mexico did. And by the way, thanks to that, a lot of harm was prevented for the rest of the world. I, I, I wrote an op-ed piece in the New York Times then making this point. China didn't do that this time. And, you know, the rest of the world is paying a price for that. We need to create incentives and then we need to give whatever mechanisms comes out of this. And, you know, there's a number of very high level panels now looking. There's an independent panel co-chaired by two uh, former heads of state and government, New Zealand and, and Liberia. Also a, a former president of Mexico is a member of that. It's a very high level panel uh, looking at, at what's going to come afterwards. And we got to mm -hmm. elevate global health security to to be a concern, uh, at, you know, at the level of the security council. There's been that idea. 
But then the agency that applies this, which is the WHO, which needs to be reformed. You know, the problem with H everyone is quick to criticize the secretariat, but it's the member states that have deliberately weakened WHO. And I think member states need to make a reflection by refusing to pay their dues, by undermining the finances, and by basically depriving WHO of the enforcement tools. I think we need to give WHO the type of tools that the World Trade Organizations and other multilaterals have to actually enforce the international health regulations, to actually impose sanctions. We need to create a standing task force that can be quickly mobilized, especially in low capacity settings when there's an outbreak and help but we need to have a standing invitation so WHO doesn't have to be sitting around until the country who has every incentive to hide the pandemic or the outbreak invites you. That, that just doesn't work. We need a stronger enforcement. That requires countries understanding that it's not about giving up sovereignty. It's about sharing sovereignty so that we are all secure, so that we improve our security, our common security. It's a very different way of thinking because, again, public so, leaders pull this flag of sovereignty. This is about sharing sovereignty. sovereignty. Nothing compromises your sovereignty more than having an out of control pandemic killing thousands and thousands of your citizens, having an economic crisis that's destroying jobs. That is a real threat to security and sovereignty. We need to share sovereignty so that we can assure uh, common security. Do you think the pandemic has demonstrated or accelerated any trends on how national governments should approach healthcare? I guess, well, I guess, I mean, telemedicine is the most obvious example, but I think it's going to go deeper. I, I think, I, hopefully, this will accelerate the global movement towards universal health coverage, which was already there, but that has to be accelerated because a lot of the poor responses in, in the poorer countries derives from the weaknesses of the pre-existing weakness of the uh, of the health system. And we just need to take that seriously. So returning back to the University of Miami, um, I mean, your experience this semester was largely very successful. Um, is there anything you do differently going forward or, or change? And how do you respond to the criticism of high cost of education if the there is a remote format? I, I, uh, oh yes, there's. I, I mean, I, I, there were some trends towards reforming higher education, and I hope that those will continue. A lot of that has been on the technological front, you know, really embracing not hybrid, but blended models. It's not. A, a, it's not what we're doing now. Now it's an emergency, where you basically have the same class and you segregate students, students who, for whatever reason, cannot be on campus. They're following remotely, and then you have some students in the classroom. That's not blended. Blended is where you mix uh, online and in-person depending on the pedagogical needs. And that's where we need to move. But it's not just that, it's the question of access. It's the question of affordability. Uh, I, 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 you know, there's a very vigorous discussion going on uh, with universities on what is the future. We need to recover the role of higher education as the most legitimate vehicle for upward social mobility. If we become part of the forces that are driving social inequality and, and deepening social inequality, I think we are not, we, we, I think higher education is not going to be fulfilling its role and, and, and the opposition will grow. So how do we make it more affordable? How, would, how do we assure student success? How do we diversify our student bodies? Uh, how do we give become a, 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 an engine of opportunity rather than a driver of inequality? That's our biggest challenge as, as higher education in this country and throughout the region. And one of the negative effects, a lot of universities are closing in Latin America, and we need to make sure that, um, that the system of higher education it, 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 it continues to grow and provide access and pathways to success into opportunity for larger and larger members of young people. 
Is there anything you would do differently um, at the university for the second semester or next year than, than what you've done now? Yeah, I mean, this time, absolutely. This time, you know, we did we have never done it. So we did a lot of learning as we went along. Uh, you know, we, 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 we took us a little bit of time to put a, a public dashboard and we got some feedback and some people were happy. We, we perfected that. Uh, and we're going to do a lot of things differently. We had to scale our testing capabilities gradually. We're now, all of that is ready now. Um, so I, I think reassuring uh, people, uh, I, I think now we have all this experience to show that this can actually be done safely. Um, but, but, uh, but the good thing is we are going to do many things better because we gained a lot of experience already. And that's that was one of that's one of the values. I mean, think about it. Um, we already had half a semester fully remote. If we hadn't opened in the fall, we wouldn't be ready to open in the spring. And a lot of universities that didn't, didn't open in the school are going to have to remain closed. You're talking now of two and a half semesters. This is you know almost a third of the college experience for a young person. <laughs> Really, I mean, this is a once lifetime opportunity. So we could got to do the best to actually do it, but do it following the science, making the investment. We have invested a lot of money to do this the right way, but that's the way you have to do it the right way. That costs money. You need to be willing to do to make those investments, but it is worth it. I I, I think that's my main conclusion. I think that's fabulous because I think otherwise we will lose generation a generation of young people. Um, in the educational system. So our careers and our lives are shaped by so many events and circumstances that we experience along the path of our lives. And you're leading more than 18,000 students at the University of Miami who have spent almost a year, will spend at least a year, maybe even a second year um, under the pandemic. What do you think they're gonna take away from this? What, what, are, what are their learnings gonna be um, in all of this? Well, you know, I've been sending these video messages for regularity uh, to the students and also to the faculty and staff, but to the students, I said early on, if we do this the right way, this will be a major episode in your lives. We have the opportunity to make the pandemic a, a, a really an educational, a teaching moment, a learning moment on the values of mutuality, of reciprocity. Wearing a face covering is not only a way of protecting me, it's a way of protecting the others. This is a lesson in the absolutely critical value that's gonna serve our students throughout their entire life if they, if they learn the lesson. That mutuality and, and responsibility actually pay off. And I think this could be an invigorating experience to recover the values of civility, civic engagement, and those values of neutrality and reciprocity. And I was telling them, if we do this the right way, you will be telling your grandchildren, right? um, although most of them cannot imagine that time in their lives, but you will be telling them that you were the generation that defeated COVID because you did the right things, because you added a, a, around those values of reciprocity, mutuality, and civility. It could be a, a shaping experience. I, I hope that's what we take and and and, and that, that students will look back with, um, with pride on what they did. This is why, for me, the other big reason was we needed to show that this generation of young people can be trusted to do something. And I know not everyone has behaved. I know there's been COVID fatigue. We have had cases. But by and large, the students have risen to the challenge. And I, I think there's a lot to be proud uh, about. Well, our time has ended and I wanna thank you for this um, fantastic conversation. Um, it's great to hear your perspectives, but I think what I've heard from you is something that everybody wants, incredible leadership. Um, I mean, you've really led not just the University of Miami and the more than 18,000 students, but I think you've provided leadership 
to the community by leading the university. And I think as we come out of this pandemic, you have such an important role to play in talking about this message um, because not many people talk about intrinsic values, value of civic engagement, that wearing a mask is not just about that it's not just about you, it's about your civic responsibility. And there are very few people that define it publicly the way you've been defining it. So I think that your leadership is so critical. And I wanna thank you for taking this time with us. Um, and I hope we can continue the conversation um, into 2021. I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. Um, I wish you all a very healthy and happy, but most of all, safe holiday season as we approach one of the most festive times of the year. Um, remember what Dr. Frank Julio said about leadership and ensuring that um, we value um, our civic engagement and think about not just ourselves, but everyone around us. So thank you for, for all of your learnings and all of your wisdom, William. Thank you, thank you, Susan. <laughs>